welcome to the Best Kept Secrets of Greene County, New York podcast, where we're letting the cat skills out of the bag. I am your host, Thomas Boomhauer, and joining me today, as always, is your co-host, Mark Gustafson. Hey, Thomas. Hello, Mark. Today, Mark and I have the privilege of visiting Sarah Gray Miller, the proprietor of Unquiet, Antiques Interiors Insubordination, which is located here at 47 South River Street in the historic Reed Street District in the village of Kitsaki. Sarah, thank you so much for taking the time to come on Best Kept Secrets and chat with Mark and I today. Thanks for coming to visit me. Once Mark told me his idea to come here and talk with you, I was through the moon. I was so excited. Why is that? <laughs> so I'm a CA graduate and I've been here a couple of times because my buddy used to live right up the street. Yeah. And I just like seeing how this cool, eclectic, unique collection of things. And I just, you know, the opportunity to talk with someone who curated this collection was very enticing to me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm so thrilled to be in the Coxsackie, Athens area. And someone said to me recently, and I think it rings true. They're like, you're not really an antiques dealer. You're a community organizer. And I would love, you know, Amen. and I would love to take the credit for that. I don't think I get the credit. I just think it's a really cool community that comes together, welcomes all sorts of cross sections, especially during the pandemic when so much of New York City and quite frankly, not just New York City, Los Angeles, Bay Area, Seattle has come to the Hudson Valley. I don't think I've seen a community welcome outsiders and sort of re-knit the fabric in interesting ways quite as beautifully as Greene County has. That's awesome to hear. That's uh, what we really do pride ourselves on. But be, one, part of my job on Best Kept Secrets of Greene County is I am the pronunciation guy, okay? And when you say Coxsackie, about- yeah. <laughs> although it is spelled C-O-X-S-A-C-K-I-E, oh. but our friend Susan uh, over at Pilot House Paper, she actually made a tote bag that gives you phonetic pronunciation. It's Coxsackie. I know. Cook-sake. You think that you're in the kitchen cooking, right. like drinking uh, um, rice wine. Right, exactly. I yeah, should sushi, you know. point out that I am originally from Mississippi. So as much as I try to say cook sake, <laughs> it's like when it's like when Mississippians try to say naked, we just say naked, naked. and anything oh, else man. feels phony. And so whenever I try to say cook sake, my mouth doesn't, just, even, just doesn't get around. I just have to say like, I'm from Mississippi and I'm just going to have to say cook sake. You're not just from Mississippi though. You're from Natchez, right? I am from Natchez, that's Mississippi. Sad. That's quite an adjustment. Yeah. I've been up here for so long. I can't even believe that I still have an accent. I came up here for college in 1989. But cook sake <laughs> reminds me actually a lot of Natchez in the sense that it's a hist- beautifully preserved, well taken care of, fronting a major river with a community. Quite frankly, sometimes I say this place might be weirder than Mississippi, which is known for its southern Gothic eccentricities. But cook sake, I just gotta say it the way I gotta say it. <laughs> Might might honestly hold the most colorful cast of characters I've ever I've ever encountered. So you know, rivaling Savannah and Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, or correct. In <laughs> fact, when my mom and I first read that book, we were like, they wrote our book about Natchez. Like, you can tell those stories, and then I got here, and I sometimes think Kaksaki might be weirder than <laughs> Charleston, Savannah, Natchez, New Orleans, all rolled into one. The tales this town could tell, indeed. And I'll tell you what, though, you know, the neat thing that you're saying is that this is a beautifully restored historic river town, Hudson River Town. And it is, but it wasn't always that way. <laughs> I, I tell everybody I did 10 years in Cooksaki. I was yeah. here from second grade to 11th grade in the Cooksaki Athens school system. And it was a great school system. That's all fine. Yeah. But the only reason you came down here to Reed Street, and we'll get into this later, was to go to the bank. Yeah. <laughs> because everything else was, or the post office, and but everything else was just an eyesore. And it was, you know, it was, how shall I put this, aged manufacturing and uh, shipping type stuff that was just not open anymore, closed up, boarded up, and just not a place you wanted to be. And then we'll get into this a lot more as we talk about the revitalization of Kuksaki, but... It is not that anymore. Uh, no, even when I first came up here as a weekender, you know, a city in the local Provence, <laughs> and I earned that title. I thought trash just magically dis- disappeared when you put it in the basement. <laughs> Kuksaki was a ghost town. Mm-hmm. 
Patrick Henry's, the original Patrick Henry's was still open back then, but just barely. But what what was miraculous about it is that people hadn't torn stuff down. Yeah. So it looked like it's, even then, it looked like a movie set for a Hallmark movie. Unfortunately, it just looked like an abandoned movie set. Indeed. You know, where they left the fake Western town and nobody came <laughs> back. <laughs> But the bare the bare bones were here for sure. But there wasn't there was literally no commerce here back then. I think except for Patrick Henry's. Maybe Blue Water Bistro was open then. Maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe that, that's. Thomas, you wanted to ask the origin story question, eh? Yes. So, Sarah Dre, would you mind walking us through your background and what led you open up opening up on Quiet? Okay. Well, that's a big question. It is. I'm going to try to give you the brief. I've already said I'm from Mississippi. So for most of my adult life, I was a magazine editor in New York City. I was the editor of Country Living Magazine, Sever Magazine, Oh at Home, Oprah's Home Magazine, best job of all time working for Oprah, Install Weddings, Install Home, Budget Living, a bunch of them. So a bunch of rags nobody's heard of is what you're saying. Well, you know, <laughs> some were well known. So, um, all of them were well known. That's it. And... I, my good friend, Matt Lee, who has a food brand with his brother called the Lee Brothers. They have a boiled peanut catalog. They've written James Beard award-winning cookbooks. They had a house here on Ely Street, which Matt still owns. I started off as a weekend guest of theirs in the early aughts and loved it up here so much that they finally had an intervention and told me that I had a job with a paycheck and <laughs> I needed to get my own GD weekend house. (laughs) And that led me to buy a house in Athens in 2008. And so for most of that time, I was a weekender. I lucked into one magazine job up here in Hudson, Modern Farmer, which I was the editor of for about three and a half years, which I loved. Scrappy, but God, did I learn so much about farming or food system. And then I think like so many people, the pandemic hit. The magazine I was running at the time, Severa, which is a food magazine, um, got the axe. Not the first print product I've helmed that got the axe. But this time, um, it got shuttered at the exact same time that the real estate market here went nuts. So suddenly, my career is not just in the toilet, quite frankly, flushed down the toilet at the same time that my Athens house was worth money. And so I just did this hard, crazy pivot maybe a little insane, and decided to sell my house, give up the magazine business. And it was actually younger friends of mine. My house was filled with antiques, collectibles. It, honestly, it was a problem. And my young friends, when I was like, I think I'll just sell the house with the contents, they were like, no, we shoot our music videos here. You're where we come to borrow props for Instagram. This is upstate porn, basically, in terms of oh. Pendleton blankets and old picnic baskets and they convinced me that I had to open either a prop shop or an antique store, pausing to take a breath. It's a long origin story. And given my friendship with Matt Lee and my familiarity with Kuxaki, I knew this building. And I had long admired, we're in the old historic firehouse here. I had long admired it. I knew that Peggy and Hugh Quigley, who live here locally, had restored it beautifully, probably now almost 25 years ago. Right. And I thought if I'm going to open a business, I would like to open it. I need an industrial space, but I also, because I'm selling my house, I need an industrial space with a full bathroom. Right. (laughs) As I figure out the next actual residence. And luckily, Matt Lee put me in touch with Peggy Quigley and I made my case. And I, in my opinion, lucked into this building and hence the the antique store. I mean, this is what I did as a passion. Mm -hmm. Um, other pe- I'm not athletic and I hate winter. So when other people up here were skiing, I was combing every junkatorium in green, Columbia, Ulster, even Dutchess County. Mm-hmm. So I, I just took my weekend passion and thought I'd make it a business. And this building spoke to me. And it is an incredible space. I mean, when you listeners are now walking around the historic Reed Street area of Kuksaki, which I invite you to do at your earliest convenience, this is a early 20th century firehouse brick. Late 1800s. Late 1800s. Actually. Okay. I, I was, uh, and it has uh, a set of doors on the front that are very distinctive, 47 
South River Street. It is beautifully restored. Uh, you can tell on the inside where the the uh, display space is that there was a wagon, a fire wagon here, not a fire engine. And there had to be horses around and all of that. And there was living space uh, upstairs and office space, I believe. But this was just, it's an incredible space. And it's a must-see while you're enjoying everything else that the historic Reed Street area has to offer. Thank you. And I've got to give the Quigley's credit for the, the real renovation and restoration. And when I became a tenant, we had a deal. They freshened the paint outside. They refinished all the mahogany doors and windows. And my job was basically paint, wallpaper, you know, the interior in a very surface way. And they actually had these doors built based on the originals from the late 1800s. Wow. And they had them built when they renovated the building right around 2000. It couldn't have been, you know, much longer than that. And what they, and then they refinished them when I moved in. And what they told me that I thought was interesting. Um, and many firemen who come through here, I should point out that it was a working volunteer firehouse through, right up until the Quigleys bought it. So through the 1990s, at least, the reason, because people are like, why did they move out? The reason was their fire truck could no longer be repaired and they had to get a new one. Mm -hmm. And the ceiling was too low to get the lit, no matter what the doors were. Right. They were and these are really high ceilings, but there was no way to get the new model fire truck. So the only way for them to get a fire truck and continue to operate was to change their location. Indeed. Indeed. So the history of what we now refer to as the village of Kuksaki, okay, wasn't the original village of Kuksaki. That's what we now call West Kuksaki. Okay. It was up away from the river. And, You're telling me things I didn't okay, know. Well, this is, the, this is part of the whole exchange. Yeah. This is why it works. Okay. So back in the early 1820s, 1820s, 1810, I think it was, there was a guy by the name of Elias something or other, it does, but I just love the name Elias. Uh, he came down to make a wharf here on the yeah. river because he saw the need of being able to get people to bring their goods down and get the, mainly it was agricultural products uh, and ice because all the tanned fur goods came out of Catskill. Mm -hmm. But they had lots of ice and lots of, of agricultural products from the from the Kuksaki Plains and from New Baltimore that would come down here and tie into this wharf. And then what happens over time is that support businesses and manufacturing businesses and something started to spring up. And it was never really planned. They never really had a layout for it. They just sort of had Mansion Street that went up past the mansions and came down to the river where all of this trade took place. Then the whole thing burned to the ground in 1864. Wow. And so what happened then is they this village fathers at the time yeah. said, okay, let's figure out where we want to put stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and they laid out the street grid that is now the village of Kuksaki and everything was And built. hence the dates of all the buildings, the is old, all old buildings are all just, just, basically late 1800. Exactly. Because that's when it was rebuilt. Yeah. And I'm wondering if the reason, this is the truth of my hometown in Mississippi, and I think it's the truth about a lot of towns that were river ports mm -hmm. is, and I'm, I don't know if it's true here. Because you would think, God, wouldn't all the people want to live right on the river? I would. This is the most beautiful thing. But from what I understood is where the commerce came by is also where the bad behavior came oh, it by. Oh, was, that was exactly The prostitution, it. the gambling, the all the fun stuff. You never went down to the wharf. It's not like you had casual outdoor dining by the you, river. You know, <laughs> correct. No. What you do now. <laughs> <laughs> now we do. Indeed. But yeah. same, same with my hometown, the actual... The houses in Natchez, Mississippi, that people think of are plantations. They weren't. No. They were suburban, entertaining villas. Mm -hmm. They were, but everything was set back up off the water, and the strip down by the water was known as being notorious. It's uh, knife fights, gamblers, prostitution, et cetera, et cetera. Also, historically, like rivers have just been abused to death. It's not just the shipping and the unsavory characters that might come in through that but it was also you know the garbage disposal that's where all yeah. the pollutant pollutants went that was the dump it was everything yeah so here's another childhood tie in 1972 mm -hmm. uh pete seeger sailed the clear water up from down river and put in at the historic catskill point and my best friend at the time tommy myers and i went on board and yeah. 
we rode the sloop all the way up here to, awesome. to Kuksaki. And then he was pointing out all of the different things that were going on uh, and all the open sewage that was being drained into the river at the time. Yeah. And this was at the height of that awareness campaign that ultimately landed, landed itself to the cleanup of the Hudson. Because when I was a kid growing up here, you did not swim in the river. It was just, you know, you, you could be killed. Yeah. You, know, you, would, you would die of poisoning. That, that was the thought. Of course, there were kids that did it, but that was not something that was done. Yeah. And here's another Even thing. to this day, people seem shocked that I swim in the river, which I do. Oh, yeah. yeah it's, it, 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 there is a stigma there. It, you know, it's, now it's not. But, I also swim in Louisiana lakes that right. are filled with water moccasins, alligators. So you know who else is on that boat ride, on, the, on that sloop? Who? Richie Havens. Oh, wow. And he was playing... And wow. he and Pete were playing guitar and banjo and wow. singing songs. And I was a 10-year-old kid, and I'm like, this is outstanding. That is <laughs> this unbelievable. is so cool. Yeah. Unbelievable. So I knew we were going to get to this, and I yeah. and sort of laid the groundwork a little bit. But I like learning stuff that I didn't know. So <laughs> I really didn't know that this downtown wasn't. Yeah, it was, the, it's all post-1864. Yeah. But the revitalization that has gone on since... I would say 2015, 2016, maybe even a little later. I would give, I would give the credit for this downtown revitalization, credit where credit is due, mm -hmm. to Susan and Shai who own the bottle shop. Indeed. You, two of my favorite people in the world. They were here first, mm -hmm. and I feel that that was maybe eight years ago. It, it was, could be. I can tell you that story. Okay. They had a place in New Baltimore. and. Yeah. At the Green County Economic Development Corporation, yeah. we produced these ebooks on yeah. starting your business in Green County. And they downloaded one of my ebooks in January of 2017, yeah. I believe it was. And we had them in premises so by we're June. We're 24. Open. We're talking seven years yeah. ago. Yeah. January 2017, they were in their premises by, the, by uh, uh, June, open with the liquor license. And everybody in the legislature came together to help them and all of, the, all of our local representation. And the village really wanted them. And they have been invaluable. And they attracted. They made this town a destination because at that point, and this again is when I was an Athens homeowner, mm -hmm. I might have at that time been full-time working for a modern farmer. But, you, you know, if we cast our memories back pre-pandemic, pre this economic, you know, sort of boom that we're having up mm -hmm. here. Athens didn't have a bottle shop. Catskill didn't have a bottle. There was a liquor store out by Walmart, but that sort of curated, refined selection really didn't exist in Greene County on this side of the river. No, it didn't. I'm not even sure if it existed in Saugerties back then. I think you could go to yeah. Ulster. You might, might have to go all the way to Woodstock to, to find that kind of curated collection. Yeah. And um, so the moment that Susan and Shia opened the bottle shop, everybody I knew from Catskill, Athens, Cairo, Durham, New... We, we were coming to Kuxaki because of the bottle shop. Right. And then shortly thereafter, the general store opened. Right. Well, it was Mansion Plus Reed, and that was, that was, those were the Post Sisters, and they had a yes. place that was a B&B, &B, and they totally redid that building. The upstairs spaces in that are fantastic. The Post Twins came up the river to in their parents' boat and look, you know, when they were little girls, and then they said, hey, this... Read, this mansion read block is open. Let's let's yeah. see what we can do with it. But uh, no, they're they're phenomenal folks too. And, and they they really did those two things: bottle shop first, but then general store. Mm -hmm. As someone who was just a homeowner in Athens, suddenly without going across the Hudson River, if I wanted to have friends over for a drink, mm -hmm. I could drive here, get great wine, great cheese, a baguette, everything I needed to throw a last minute cocktail party. And I know I'm not alone in that. Although for a long time, those two businesses were alone in making this town they a destination. Were, and then, then Susan opened Pilot House Paper, which is one of the most eclectic little analog shops out there. Correct. It's all about cards and tactile writing and wrapping papers and things like that. Amazing, amazing place. But that just got too, her business has gotten too big for herself. Not the Pilot House Paper business, but she's an incredible designer. And she... Uh, well, I think what people don't realize about Kuxaki, which I want to point out about my neighbors, is, oh, what a quaint small town bottle shop. Let me explain mm -hmm. that Susan was the creative director at Shutterfly. The, mm -hmm. Like, she has a booming graphic design business mm -hmm. out of that. It's, it's, yes, it's small town charm, 
but, but he's it's made, by design. <laughs> correct. And I, say, I, I would say the same thing about Caitlin over at Shipwrecked. Now, Caitlin's a local. Okay. Uh, she grew up here. She's in Irwin, okay? And her, her uncle Jim and I were in the same year in, in, in school. Okay, you're going to love this. Mm-hmm. So my one of my best friends in the world, best friends here, Kara Cragen, went to college with me. She bought the Irwin's old house on Lafayette. Gotcha. So I first met Caitlin because Kara had befriended the child of the people she bought the house from. Gotcha. And what Caitlin is doing is also vaguely analog. It's a bookshop, it but it's a breakfast cafe. place, but it's a bar on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But I also want to say about Caitlin, yeah, she's a local girl, but mm-hmm. a local girl who worked at Gramercy Tavern, mm-hmm. at Colicchio and Sons in the city. Um, she knows what she's doing. We, we call those people born and breds that have been somewhere. Yeah. They, they were born here and they didn't. They had the means to go somewhere else, and then they came back. We always call them hometown girl gone off, done good. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. The first time I met Caitlin and found out who she was, I was actually going in to get a, my favorite bottle of rye at Shy's place. Yeah. He kept in there for me. And then he also kept, he had friends down in, in Brooklyn that were making Negronis in a box. They're like yeah. like a a box of Negronis that you can put in your refrigerator. And of course, my wife just went absolutely yeah. ballistic over that. But I went in and Shy wasn't there one day. And there's this lovely young woman behind the counter. And we got talking. And then the next year, she opened Shipwrecked. And yeah. Shipwrecked is just absolutely a wonderful little destination spot. But the real anchor that is drawing things down here, I mean, the reason I think now that these businesses are going to succeed are... I got to give a shout out to a visionary developer by the name of Aaron Flack, who has bought a bought a, an old industrial site and turned it into a luxury destination hotel and event center right down here on the river. He probably owns the whole other side of the street that mm-hmm. my business is, yeah, is he, on. Yeah, and and the Flack family's been here for a long time too. But the, this this the James E Newbury Hotel, the Wire Convention Center. Our event center, which is Patrick Henry's. The Patrick They've Henry's. They've got the spa. And now, opened the, now. The latest thing is the old Dolan block, which was an eyesore when I was here and is still an eyesore. The, but is basically, let's be honest, it's the crown jewel of the town. It's the linchpin to this town looking like something fantastic. It's going to be because of the fact that when they do this Dolan block, yeah. they've got $4.5 million in state awards to be able to yeah. do that. And it's going to be street level retail, and I don't know um, if it's all going to the Dolan Block no, by itself. But, uh, no, but, but they were definitely pushed forward by the local planning committee, indeed, to get a chunk of that money because I think everybody here recognizes. Look, every customer who comes into my antique store, what's happening with that big brick built? What's going on? What's going on? And I do tell them, it's the same guy who's done everything else across the street. And you know, the you can envision now. Going from the wire up the river along the along the shore to this beautifully restored adjacent state boat launch and riverside park that is just state of the art. By the way, shout out to New York State. Indeed, it's Indeed. it's. I think it is the best use of riverfront land by a community, like really in all of Green Columbia. Maybe Kingston can rival us a little bit with the Rondau, yeah, but. Yeah. It's spectacularly done. Yeah, it is. It's absolutely wonderful. And again, another reason for you listeners to get your tails down to Reed Street in Kuksaki. Yeah, and so the riverfront to that point, you know, it's always been pretty good. Like the yeah. the riverfront part. That's where we would take our prom pictures in high school. Yeah. And then after the state money came in and they were able to redevelop it even further, it's like breathtaking now. It's I can't believe how sensitive every choice was. I'm just gonna say it like I can be super critical of other people's aesthetic decisions. I'm off. I'm hard to please. I'm often disappointed. Mm-hmm. And when that opened, and I was so new here, I don't even think I'd open the store. Maybe I'd just open the store. And I went across the street. Every design decision made there is so respectful of the local community. I just the and the subtlety of you know. Etching into the pavement, into the seating, into everything, 
the fish the average is, fish is the, the, the record, the record fish, fish yeah. what our local industries are yeah. quotes from it's it's so of the place in which it sits and the renovation is so sensitive to history to Kuxaki, but also i think sensitive to the way people use space the grills you can access, the picnic tables you can access, the Adirondack chairs. My dog, Mr. Chips, who's been making some light background noise thus far. That's where we walk every morning. And every morning when I walk out there, I am reminded of how fortunate I am to conduct my life in this tiny town. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Well, I think we've sung the praises of the of the town and the village, and and uh, we talked a bit about the business community and how. I want to say one nice thing about what Aaron's done, though, because I feel like I didn't get it in. Good. The moment that hotel opened, I can't tell you what it's done for my businesses. See, that's what I was trying to get to with the. the uh, it is a synergetic business community down here, right? Everybody shows up at your place every once in a while. In fact, There's- everybody who almost everybody who works for Aaron, they all close at nine, and mm-hmm. we'll get into the fact that I've got a bar in the back. After they close, his people come here. Yeah. His when he opened the wedding venue, I got some traffic. But when the hotel opened, yeah. And there are probably like I think eight wedding venues within about an eight mile radius of right. this town. Suddenly there was a place for them to stay. Mm-hmm. I'm packed every weekend with those people. It's been so helpful to my business. And then generally speaking, about all of us down here, I once had a wine delivery that didn't show up. I could call Susan. Let me see what we've got. I've run out of bitters and gone to Patrick Henry's and to the hotel, and they've given me bitters. And next time I get a case, I pay two bottles of bitters back. There you go. Good I've investment. gone to events there where I didn't have cash to tip the bartender. Mm-hmm. The bartender knows he can, I'll say I don't have cash, but I'll get you back. Mm-hmm. He can come over here and have two drinks free on me because I didn't tip him. Mm-hmm. That is universal. And we also didn't mention Steve's vintage clothing, which I think is really important. This is new to me. Okay, so now you're going to educate me. I'm going to educate you to the best of my ability. Okay. So Anna Taylor owns Steve's. Steve is her uncle who had a giant vintage warehouse. Fact check me on this. Giant vintage clothing warehouse out on 9W that a lot of costume designers went to. That, Do you know yeah, no, I know about? what you're talking about. Yeah. So Anna, his niece, who's really quite young, by my standards, like 20s. She, her and I went to high school together, same so graduating class. She's yes. lovely. So she took what her uncle was doing almost in a B2B way and curated it and made it fashion and was on 385 on Mansion Street for a while. And it was only summer before last that she moved it down here mm-hmm. um, with her business partner. I don't think- Bridget like, McWigan. Yeah, Bridget. But I, I'm not sure if they're business partners or- they're definitely best friends. They're symbiote. And Bridget does this tailoring that's unbelievable. So they joined, I feel like Caitlin opened summer of 2021. I opened winter of 2021. Anna and Bridget brought Steve's down here the summer of 2022. And it was almost like, oh, now we're a destination for people from Rhinebeck, mm-hmm. from Poughkeepsie, from Newburgh, from Albany, because there's vintage furniture and accessories, but also vintage clothing. There's wine. With Caitlin, there's books. There's a place to eat. And I really think what, what Anna and Bridget have done is unbelievable. And Anna does this tailoring where if you have the guts to go in and bring something broken and not tell her what you want, you'll get surprised in the most delightful way. Awesome. So I took in an old London track club t-shirt and Bridget repaired the holes with what looked like train tracks. <laughs> a friend of mine brought in a moth-eaten sweater and Bridget mended it with moth appliques over every hole. I mean, it just, and I just think it's so perfectly curated. So I should mention them too. And we do also help each other out. They've done pop-ups here. Very cool. I'm going to have to come down for those. Good- can't, I, I've got to make sure that I uh, bring my wife because Nancy will go crazy over something like that. That's amazing. All right. So we've been singing the praises of some of your neighbors, some of the other businesses on the in the historic Reed Street District. Yeah. What have you found have been some of the opportunities and challenges running unique? Or, sorry, running on quiet. I can see it's very close spelling. When you see it in print, it's hard to, but I'm definitely on quiet more than I'm unique. 
look, the, cha- the challenge for me, it has nothing to do with where I'm situated. I'd never owned an antique store before. I've actually never owned my own business before. This is so amazing because our, the conversation we had in our last yeah. podcast, these are two, a, a key grip and a costume or union film people that were working in New York, yeah. living in Cairo because they loved it up there. And, yeah. and one would get a job in New York and one would, get a, would, ta- would take care of their boys. And then the other one would get a job in New York. And then, so they had an apartment in New York and they had the place in Cairo. And one day they just said, let's open a coffee shop. Never had any idea. Same. to do it. So <laughs> I did. I did in high school mm-hmm. work retail for a couple guys who had an antique store. And but again, when credit card machines went yeah. and you called the company and I was a teenager. So I've never owned my own business. I've loved antiques. I certainly worked in magazines that were about decor, collectibles, lifestyle. But no, I had never done this before in my life. So the challenge is um, were immense. I, I feel sort of that I have some expertise in the subject matter of old stuff. Um, my parents are architectural historians. I was born in Wilmington, Delaware, because my dad was studying decorative arts at the Winotour Museum. So like the stuff and country living was all about collecting and basically ex-urban lifestyle porn. Like at that I got, but actually owning a business, I had been a... Even when I worked for indie magazines, I had been a salaried employee with health insurance and benefits and an accounting department and a legal department. So the big challenge was I had never done anything like this before in my life. Mm-hmm. You may be a perfect candidate. I know, you, I know you're doing well, but one of the things that the Green County Economic Development Corporation is going to be doing is business boot camps and what we're calling the Business Amplifier Program. Yeah. It's going to be coming up. And it's all about helping small business navigate some of the things that they may be unfamiliar or uncomfortable with. Oh, I need, I still, like I've been at this now for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. No, I still need help. And I still find that there are things that I don't know how to do. And I tend to lean into the things that I'm good at, which is being customer facing, which is styling the shop, which is even Instagram I fall behind on. And then I ignore the laptop work. And there are definitely moments where it seems like I'm super flush. This is my first winter opening, having one of my business. This is my first real winter doing everything I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And I got, I was setting my financial expectations based on the summer season. And I have definitely had this small business mm-hmm. where I need to make X amount of money this weekend mm-hmm. to pay the rent. Mm-hmm. Or to buy the next round of inventory or to re-up something. So the learning curve for me has been very, very steep. Um, I have been very lucky because Green County Economic Development, this community, everyone else in it, has been so incredibly helpful. And it's good to know what you don't know. So before I did a lot of what I did, I reached out to other people who have done it. There you go. Um, and said, what point of sale do you use? If you could go back in time and tell yourself five things, what would those things be? You you know what I mean? But oh no, the the learning curve has been incredibly steep. And it's not because of where I'm located. It's because I have a like as just zero experience in some ways. And in some ways I'm an expert in what Mm -hmm. I'm doing. In other ways, I have zero experience in what I'm doing. Okay, so Every episode of Best Kept Secrets of Greene County, New York, we do a reveal. And the reveal here, if it's not been enough, that we're in a late 19th century firehouse in an incredible space filled with all sorts of antiques, ideas for interior, and definitely insubordination here at Unquiet, (laughs) there's a bar attached to the back of it, a speakeasy called Ravish Liquors, and the reveal is... It used to be the village jail. It did. Once upon a time, these were two separate buildings. From the outside, they look like separate buildings with the antique store in what used to be the firehouse and the bar in what used to be the jail. Quite some time ago, early 20th century, I believe, the alley that used to separate the two buildings was enclosed, making them one. So I do have now, of course, technically, there's no such thing as a speakeasy because technically we're allowed to serve liquor. 
but it has speakeasy vibes and that it is hidden, tucked behind the antique store and um, notated on the outside with a vintage liquor store sign. So people do often come in here thinking I'm a liquor store. And I say, oh, you want to go to Reed Street Bottle Shop, you know, cut through the parking lot, make a sharp left. It was not my plan to open a bar. <laughs> okay, so how? Well, here's what happened. Only an idiot, and I admitted to being a novice, would open an antique store in the dead of winter in upstate New York in the middle of a pandemic, which is what I did in December 2021. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> Foolish. I got... Because I'm from Mississippi and I'm sort of a natural s- Southern hostess drinker, I got a reputation for opening a bottle of wine in the shop every day at four. So that winter, we had a snow squall, an ice storm. There was a weather event every Saturday and Sunday without fail. I was in here by myself. I'd uncork something at four and then my friends would show up. Then their friends would text, what are y'all doing? We're at Sarah Gray's shop. Then my customers to the shop became my friends and it I want to say it was pretty sudden. About a month in, didn't take me long, I realized that I was running a not terribly successful antique store and a wildly popular nonprofit nightclub (laughs) at the old jail in the back. (laughs) And so at that moment, it was, and I think this is a good lesson for people who own a business, best laid plans. This is what you think you are. This is what the public wants you to be. And so I began probably in like, February or March of 2022, I began the process of getting a liquor license and opening the bar slash speakeasy in the back. And was that assisted by any of this marvelous business community that we have down here? I can't tell you how much the lack of experience I had in the antiques business is nothing compared to the lack of experience I had in the liquor and food business. And yeah, that's the one piece of advice I would give to anyone doing anything. Know what you don't know and ask for help. So for instance, with the antiques business, Deb Parker, who has Sister Salvage, was incredibly helpful to me when I decided to open the bar. I didn't even know how you went about getting a liquor license. I didn't know how you went about buying booze. Susan and Shai, who owned the bottle shop, my thing was, I'll buy you a meal if if I can just rack your brain for like an hour and a half. And they explained to me what I needed to know about getting a liquor license, how it worked to buy from New York State distributors. They did everything for me. And then the health department was even scarier. And Caitlin from Shipwrecked not only walked me through it, but gave me really good advice, which was don't be, don't be New York City, make it perfect and wait for someone out to get you. Here, the health department wants you to win. So enlist someone from the beginning, admit that you don't know anything, get that person on your side, and they will help you through the process, which the New York State Health Department at every turn mm-hmm. Instead of seeing them as the bad cop looking to catch me, I consider them almost unpaid consultants who have helped me figure out where the sink should go. That's a real positive attitude and and it helps everybody do their job. And that's fantastic. It's really true. And they they have paid it back to me in compliments that when I needed a, I did a crawfish boil in the back area behind the bar and I thought my permit covered it and I reached out and it didn't cover it. And then I was like, I need it expedited. I've sold tickets. I've sold tickets. And guess what? They expedited that thing for me. They really helped me. I had to drive to Anianta with a check for $30 Mm -hmm. where the gas was triple. But when I got that check there, they bent over backwards to get me that license because they said, you ask permission instead of forgiveness and we want to reward that good behavior. And Very cool. Yeah. So I have to let everybody that's listening know that this is the first place in my well-traveled life that I was exposed to Frito pie, (laughs) which is the most amazing chili over a bag of Fritos. You eat it out of the bag. It is most one of the most amazing comfort foods I've ever had in my life. And your gumbo doesn't stink either. I'll tell you what, it's pretty awesome. So a little bit of Cajun River culture and Southern hospitality in a speakeasy that is named Ravish liquors. Now, this is where the real reveal comes in because with so many ties here, you guys may want to get a pad paper and start drawing a map because this is really amazing stuff. As you knew that Sarah's been a, Sarah Gray has been a, and still is, an incredible finder of unique objects. And you found this 
old neon sign where? I found this sign. I mean, at least, I think it might be 15 years ago, at least 12 or 13 years ago, there used to be a flea market in front of where Back Bar is now on Warren Street in Hudson. This guy, Reggie, who lived in Athens, would sell stuff there. And I was there and came across this old neon sign that said Ravish Liquors, not functional in horrible condition. And if I may be slightly off color, the reason I bought it was the name sounded... Suggestive. Suggestive. (laughs) Filthy funny. And if you say it slowly, ravish lick her, you will understand why this sign amused me. (laughs) And so I purchased it immediately for, I mean, honestly, very little money if memory serves, somewhere in the two to 300 range and took it home. And I never restored it. I didn't need for it to light up. I was just delighted by it. So I hung it above my bathtub in my old house in Athens, the house that I sold to fund the midlife crisis that is the bar and antique store. (laughs) And um, once I pivoted in my business and realized that people liked drinking here more than they liked antique shopping here, um, I was like, I'm going to open a bar and I know what I'm going to call it because I already have the sign. It's going to be Ravish Liquors. Now, I could never find anything out about the sign when I Googled And I'm a good Googler. I'm a former journalist. Mm -hmm. All I knew was that it had been a liquor store on Fairview Avenue in Hudson. Couldn't find it. I made sure I could get, before I decided to open a bar with the name, made sure I could get the LLC, made sure I could get the domain name, made sure it was clear, which it was. And then I hired a fabricator from over in Athens to restore the sign. So many moving parts. Hardwiring of electric, the restoration of the old chicken wire cage on the neon. I didn't want plexi. Mm -hmm. A custom built bracket. So, my fabricator, Dan McInerney, shout out, said he could do everything but the glass blowing and the neon. And he subcontracted that out locally to someone in Hudson, took the sign to them, dropped it off. Nobody said anything. He didn't say anything to me. He went back to check on the progress. And the guy who was working on the sign, his mother was there and asked Dan, Did this sign used to hang above someone's bathtub? Oh, my spooky. And Dan (laughs) said, you know, I don't know. I'm doing this for my dad's friend. And she's why? And she said, I saw this hanging above a bathtub in country living 10 years ago. (laughs) So Dan says, oh, well, then it's definitely my client, Sarah Grace. She used to work at country living. But why would you remember a picture in country living from over a decade ago? And she said, because my father made the sign. So unbeknownst to Dan, who was working on it, unbeknownst to me, the guy who was restoring the neon and the glass was the grandson of the guy who had originally made the sign. And this guy made the sign for a guy that ran a liquor store? Well, this is when I finally got the backstory. Okay. So Dan called me. He's like, okay, I've got, I know everything you need to know. It was, why would someone name a store Ravish Liquors? It was opened by a guy. I say it's the best name of all time. I always do it with like a finger gesture. Tony Ravish. (laughs) And Tony Ravish was a professional baseball player, a World War II vet. He went on to be a scout for the Yankees and the Red Sox. And he also, on the side, ran this liquor business um, in Hudson. And once I Googled him, I was able to find a picture of him devilishly handsome, lives up to the name. Um, And I was also able to find out that he played for the Amsterdam rug makers, uh, a a minors team in Amsterdam, New York. He also starred in some Hollywood, uh, starred, had roles in some Hollywood movies about baseball, including one called Big Leaguer. Mm. And since then, My fear, once I found it out, was that his relatives, like, oh, are they going to be upset? And I didn't mean to take his business. I just, the opposite has been the case. Everybody who's read about Ravish Liquors in the newspaper or found it online, all of his descendants have reached out to say how thrilled they are and how honored they are that their grandfather, great-grandfather, great-uncle, uncle's legacy lives on and is being preserved and when they several of his descendants have come here for a drink and i always take a picture of them underneath the sign so here's another local tie-in for you tony ravish when he was a scout for the yankees 
was very interested in local talent because he was from Hudson. Yeah. And he was very involved in the youth baseball programs. And my dad, who was um, also a World War II vet, but took a different path instead of playing ball and running a liquor store, he became a correctional officer. And then he also ran a lot of the uh, Babe Ruth leagues uh, around, especially in Catskill. He quickly identified this young man by the name of Bill Stafford from Athens, who got, who got turned out to Tony, who then became a pitcher for the New York Yankees. And he was around wow. during the post-DiMaggio Mickey Mantle era. Okay, yeah. so around... The heyday, basically. Yeah, in the 60s. Well, some people will argue Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, you know, that, but, but let's uh, talk about stuff we can remember. <laughs> the, it's uh, even slightly before my time. Right? I just admit. I'm old, but not that old. I was born in 1962, and I'm an only child, and my parents were married in 1944, so they had a whole life in front of me. And my dad was actively involved with uh, all of these sports teams, and Billy remembered this. And when I was born, the team was in, at um, spring training in Fort Lauderdale. And so Billy took a baseball, wrote Happy Birthday Mark from all the Yankees, March 17th, 1962, and had everybody sign it. In 1962, that ball contains Mickey Mantle, Roger Maris, Yogi Berra, Whitey Ford, wow. Billy Stafford. And it's the entire team ball from that year. It is now proudly possessed by my dear nephew, who is also named Mark. So Unbelievable. <laughs> and Tony Ravish facilitated that through your Yes, he did. Absolutely. So Crazy. Yeah. amazing connections here and uh, constantly revealing best kept secrets of Green County. You could also say it's a small world, but we all kind of come from different worlds and yeah. wound up here. Yeah. So I think there are places on this planet. My mom says this about Natchez, Mississippi that are sacred hubs of the universe. And I am convinced that Greene County is one of them. <laughs> Hard to refute. <laughs> Sarah Gray, it's been a true pleasure. Same. Thank you for spending the time with us. And if you have not been to Reed Street in Cooksaki lately, you haven't been to Reed Street. So come on down here. Let's pop your head into Unquiet. Have a cocktail at Ravis Liquors. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Well, that's a wrap on today's episode of Best Kept Secrets of Green County, New York podcast. So until next time, we've got places to go, things to do, and stories to tell. <laughs>